this week things are going to be a little different. I'm still reviewing the show, but you'll notice that my voice is incredibly hoarse and I'm not on camera. And the reason for this is because unfortunately I have COVID. Um, I'm okay. I'm recovering, but um, you can understand why I probably don't want to be on camera right now and why I sound the way I do. But I do want to do this review um, because I also went on vacation, which is probably where I caught COVID. And um, I did not post my my review when I normally would have because I was away and out of town. And so now we are up to episode five, but I do want to post my review of episode four and then do episode five separately. Um, so this was a really good one. There was a lot that happened. The plot has developed a lot. And um, there's just so much nuance and we can kind of see how what happens this season, this week, really sets the tone for what's going to happen throughout the season and um, for all of the major things that are going to happen with all of these characters in history, um, in real life. So let's start with Elizabeth. So we know when we left off the last time, she was banished from Chelsea Manor because um, Catherine Parr discovered that she and Thomas were, were having an affair. As we start off here, we see that Elizabeth worries that she may be pregnant. She hasn't had her period. She reveals this to her lady-in-waiting, Kat, and Kat is very disappointed in her. She knew that something was going on. You know, she suspected that something was going on between Elizabeth and Thomas, but she didn't know for certain, and um, now this is the confirmation, and she's disappointed in Elizabeth because, you know, she is supposed to, she's a princess. She's a young lady. Um, and I also think that Kat feels like this is a reflection on her and how she has been raising her. Um, when Elizabeth mentions that they should fetch a woman, which essentially means somebody who can come and give her an abortion of some sort, Kat is even surprised that Elizabeth knows of such a thing, that there is such a thing as fetching a woman. Because remember, Elizabeth is 15 years old at this point. But, um, you know, she's disappointed. They are now staying with Kat's sister's family. And um, she's just saying, telling Elizabeth, hey, you know, don't say anything. Keep this to yourself. You've always been a little dramatic. Your period will show up. And if it doesn't, then I'll fetch a woman. Um, we also see that Elizabeth is, has been sending letters to Catherine to apologize. She feels horrible about what has happened. You know, she she did see Catherine as a mother figure. And I know, and I believe that she didn't want to hurt her, but she was, and probably still is, so in love with Thomas that, you know, she, and, and she's a young girl. She was seduced, essentially. And um, this is the, this is what happened. You know, she has been put out. Um, she might be pregnant. You know, her, her stepmother isn't speaking to her. And then we also learn later that there are all these rumors swirling. Because um, Catherine has, I'm sorry, Elizabeth hasn't been coming to court. They know that she's left Catherine's house. And while she has been asked to leave, Lady Jane Grey is still there. So it's this story that Catherine is pregnant and just needs some time to herself or she just doesn't need the stress of having guests doesn't sound so true when Lady Jane Grey is still staying there. So um, Elizabeth is in a bad place. We see that she's sad. She's obviously missing Thomas. She feels set aside. She's not sure what's happening with her current situation. She's not sure if she's a prisoner. She doesn't know if she can leave. You know, she's just feeling extremely um, despondent and um, understandably so. Mary decides to come and see her sister. And uh, Mary tells her that, you know, there is gossip about her. You know, Elizabeth apologizes for the letter. Mary says, you know, I'm over that. Um, but you need to come out of hiding. You need to come to court. Because, you know, the less people see you, the more they're going to speculate about what's going on with you. And um, Elizabeth wants to tell her what's going on. You know, she wants to confess to her big sister about, you know, the possible pregnancy and, you know, the affair with Thomas and everything. I mean, imagine she has a lot to get off of her chest. And probably the only person she feels like she could trust is her big sister. Um, but Mary doesn't want to hear any of it. You know, Mary is a devout Catholic. She does, She tells her to, just to confess her sins to God. You know, she doesn't want any parts of it. And what's one interesting thing that Mary says to her 
is that, you know, she says, don't hand me the power to destroy you and then ask me not to use it. Because we have to remember, while they are sisters, there is a huge power play at hand here. You know, all three of Henry VIII's children have different mothers. And we know that Mary and Elizabeth were deemed bastards at some point because he, Henry believed that his marriages to both Anne Boleyn and Catherine of Aragon um, were annulled because of, you know, and that's a whole nother story, you know, his situation with Catherine, you know, because she had been married to his brother. And then the, the situation with Anne Boleyn, because, you know, he had deemed her a witch at one point. I mean, that's a whole nother story. But essentially, in setting aside his marriages to their mothers, he sets aside their um, their rights to the throne. And women then didn't really have a right to the throne in that sense of the word. But... Um, they were, in a sense, put out of the line of succession, and all of his, um, all of this was put onto Edward, his his only son, um, because Edward is a boy, and because he believed his marriage to Jane was pure and untainted, and and it was. But we also have to remember Jane died pretty soon after giving birth to Edward. I think she and Henry may have only been married for a year or two or something like that. So that marriage didn't have a chance to fall apart because you'll see all of Henry's marriages did because of the kind of man he was. But anywho, so I say this all to say is that these two women, while they are sisters and they have affinity and love for each other, they do recognize, or at least Mary recognizes that, you know, the, the, that England would like to see them be at odds because they represent the two different um, to two different religion dominant religions, you know, Protestantism and Catholicism, and there are a group of people on each side who would love to see each of them take the throne so that they can align themselves with Mary or Elizabeth and to build and to get themselves into a position of power. So Mary recognizes that, you know, the realm doesn't really want them to be united. So when she says don't hand me the power to destroy you and ask me not to use it. What it means is that if Mary were to, if Elizabeth was pregnant and Mary was to reveal this information or to um, advise Elizabeth um, in the wrong direction, this would just assert her ascension to the throne. Now, of course, Edward is the, the king. He's also a little boy. But Mary knows that there's a huge faction of England that is... Um, huge supporters of Catholicism, of the Pope, um, of the, the, the church, of Catherine of Aragon, and then thereby of Mary, and would like to see her vie for the throne. She has indicated that she doesn't have any interest in this because she, I mean, I don't know exactly why. I mean, things will change later, but it seems like Mary just wants peace, but she knows that if she were to, um, to rally the troops that they would come to her support and that this could become some type of a civil war in the nation. And that would mean that she would be at odds with both her brother and her sister. So she's telling Elizabeth is don't give me information that I could use against you later. Um, and Elizabeth being naive and young and maybe hopeful that her sister, sister's love for her would supersede all this other political stuff doesn't quite get it and wants to confide to her, but Mary tells her not to, so she does not. Later, we see that Mary has a conversation with Catherine, um, Catherine Parr. And this was another good one because, um, you know, Mary, like I said before, she's seen a lot. You know, her mother went through, went through some really hard times at court once Henry decided he didn't want to be married to her anymore. Um, and she saw how things have gone back and forth and she's seen all of the um, political unrest. When she spoke to Catherine and she told her that, um, you know, she was disappointed in her for choosing Thomas Seymour as her husband. You know, he is just not a good choice. He's not a man of honor. You know, you were once married to the king and while that we know that that wasn't ideal, you know, it also brought with it a certain level of dignity and you've taken yourself down several notches by marrying this man. I mean, he's a drunk. He's not of honor. He doesn't seem to take life very seriously. And now we learn that he seduced her young sister. 
um, Catherine doesn't really have a defense for that. Only that she says is that she she got to choose him, you know, and that was the probably the well, that was the first time she was able to choose her partner, and now she was in love with Thomas before she was forced to marry King Henry VIII. But I don't think that she didn't see him for what he was, but she felt free for the first time. Her first husband was a man who was a lot older than her, and she was forced probably by her parents to marry him. And then once Henry VIII got his eye on her, decided he wanted her to be his sixth wife, she really had no choice in the matter. So once he died, I think she just exercised her freedom in um, probably in not the, well, it wasn't the wisest way, but she felt like it was a decision that was hers. And that's what empowered her and maybe emboldened her to make such a decision. What I do love about Mary is that she is quite smart. I mean, she knows how the court works. You know, she's been observing this for a very long time. So um, she goes to court to see her brother. And um, you remember last week or the week before, there was this whole issue of the letter that Elizabeth had written to Mary, essentially saying that she was going to side with Edward. And then um, in response, Edward and, and the council um, were started to get worried that maybe Mary would feel like she's an enemy of the court and she was going to start to rally her span, her um, Christian, her, sorry, her Catholic supporters. And what she wants to do is to calm this. She doesn't want any beef with her family and in order to let them know she decided to come to court and to uh, make it known that she is not an enemy and she's not somebody to be concerned about so she comes to court she asks for an audience with her brother and she tells him that you know she misses him that all three of them are family you know, Edward says that Elizabeth has abandoned them because she hasn't been at court. And she says Elizabeth just hasn't been well. So what she's trying to do is kind of like squelch some of the rumors and also reaffirm that the three of them are brothers or siblings and that they need to um, come together. Um, and she's wise enough to realize that any conversation that is too serious or heavy is probably going to go in the wrong direction. You know, she knows that her brother is heavily influenced by all of his advisors, Lord Somerset and, and who have you. Um, so she tries to make it light and says, let's do something fun. Appeals to the brother-sister relationship and appeals to him as a child. And they watch a cockfight, um, which apparently is extremely entertaining at that time in history because everybody in court seemed to really adore it. Um, she, while she's enjoying this moment, we see that um, Sir Pedro, who has become her confidant and friend, is actually a spy for Lord Somerset. Now, this took me as a surprise because I truly believed, um, and I do believe that Pedro does care about Mary. You know, he is a devout Catholic. Um, he is from Spain, where her mother is from. You know, he's a mercenary. He, he's a hired hand. But I do believe that, number one, he's a man of faith. And number two, he seems to be a man of honor. And when he and Mary, um, when he and Mary became friendly and he became her, um, and I don't know what his official title is or what the nature of the relationship is officially, but once he decided he was going to have her back, so to speak, I believe that it was a genuine thing. Um, and to learn that he has been hired by Somerset to spy on her was very disturbing for me. Um, but we do learn later that he is, in fact, a man of honor because, you know, when he learns from Lord Somerset that the pillaging of all of the Catholic churches was not because of this idea of religion and of reformation, the way that they try to sell it, but it's more about pillaging from the churches the church has had a lot. There was a lot of um, money and resources in the church. I mean, there was the gold and there was, um, you know, a lot of what they called idolatry and things of that nature, which was actually pretty valuable. And if they went to the church under the guise of trying to shut it down, 
because of religious reasons. And then what happens is the church and all of its um, all of its um, assets and property then become the property of the crown. The crown can then use that money for whatever it wants. And um, we know that Somerset is trying to fund this war with Scotland right now. So his idea here was to, you know, he's playing everybody. He's selling it to Edward as a reformation. And then, therefore, Edward is giving him the okay to lead this um, these attacks on the church, which we saw in the early part of the episode when they came in and they beat up the priests and they stole, they took all of the property and, you know, chalices and all those other, um, other things that were inside of the church that had value. What we see is... He's playing both sides here. He's telling this to Edward. So Edward feels like he's doing something great and he's doing this reformation and it's really based on religion, but it's not. It's really based on money so that he can fund this war. So when he has this conversation with Sir Pedro, we can tell that Pedro is disturbed, um, number one, because he's a Catholic and number two, because, you know, he's come to have an affection for Mary. So he feels a way about the fact that he is doing this. Um, and then he just, you know, he just has a... Um, more a, a solidified view of who Somerset really is. I'm sure he knew on some level, but now he sees him for the man he is. And um, this is bothering his conscience. And later he reveals this to Mary. He tells her um, what is actually happening. And he takes her to one of the churches to show her what has happened. And Mary has an opportunity to see it and to also have a conversation with the priest. So now she knows that um, Somerset is really playing her. And he's trying to make it seem as if, you know, he wants peace and that they're all on the same team and that he has no ill intentions, but she comes to learn exactly what it is. So, you know, Pedro had a moment where he dipped um, for me and I was just like, oh man, let me find out that he's a scoundrel too. But then he rebounds and we realize that he actually is a man of honor, somebody who just made a poor mistake and trusted the wrong person. So moving on to Catherine Parr and Thomas, you know, we learned at the end of last episode that Catherine was pregnant. Um, and we see in the beginning of this episode, Elizabeth thinks she's pregnant. Fortunately, Elizabeth gets her period and we learned that that, that is not the case. Um, Catherine does go on to, um, to have, give birth to a baby girl. And um, before she gives birth, we can see how distressed she is. She's in conflict with her relationship with Thomas. I mean, particularly after that conversation with Mary, we know that she knows what Thomas is and she knows she's probably made a mistake in marrying him, but she's in too deep now and she does love him. And they have a conversation in which, you know, she expresses how upset she is, you know, that she's so mad with him that, you know, she can't even respond to Elizabeth's letters you know, she's, she recognizes Elizabeth is just a little girl. She knows that she's been seduced, but she's just so angry that she can't even acknowledge her. Um, you know, she's had to put her out of her house and, you know, it's embarrassing now. And even her relationship with Lady Jane Grey is strained because she doesn't know who to trust. You know, she's hurt. She's emotional. She's pregnant. She's going through a lot and she makes a decision, you know, to, to forgive him. You know, she's highly disappointed, but she does love him. Um, and what she, an interesting conversation they had, she calls him a small man, you know, and he tries to, um, protest and say, well, no, and tries to, I guess, make excuses for his behavior. And she tells him, you know, let me think you are a small man. It's better that than what I feared. And I thought that was pretty compelling because what I took it to mean is it's easier for me to believe that you are just incapable of being any better than you are. I'd rather think that than to think that you are a manipulator or a monster or a rapist or all these other horrible things that you couldn't, he can be perceived to be based on his behavior. So it's, it's easier, it's easier to swallow to just think, you know what, you're just a really, um, you're a small man who just can't control himself. You know, you're just not, um, emotionally mature, you know, you're stunted, you, you just don't have the tools to be a good husband or to be a good man. And I can probably live with that more so than I can live with thinking that you are um, 
a manipulative, horrible person. You know, and remember, she was married to Henry VIII, and she saw him, well, A, she knew who he was, you know, she knew the history of him and the things he had done, which is why she didn't want to marry him. But while they were married, she saw his behavior and how, you know, his opinions swung and how evil he could be um, and cruel. And so she, you know, she knows what that looks like. And I think for her, she can't sleep at night thinking that she's met another man who has those those capacities, the capacity to be that. So for her, it's easier to just say, you know what, he's just not equipped and I will just love him through this. And while it was a tough pill to swallow for her, um, I have to say that I admire on some level her ability to do that because I don't know that I could and I don't know that many people could because that's a lot to forgive and, and we do know forgiveness is a choice, right? So she, regardless of what Thomas said to her, regardless of what he promised her, she also knew that, you know, he's going to do what he's going to do. And she had to make a decision to make peace with it so that she could be at peace, which is essentially what she did. Um, sadly enough, after they make this peace, after she gives birth to the little girl and, you know, she dies from what they call childbirth fever or childbed fever, which is something that happened often back then. And um, while she's, you know, um, while Thomas is out celebrating the birth of his little girl, she dies at home. He comes back and finds her dead and he's distraught, understandably so. And then this leads to a really good conversation we see happening with him and his brother, Lord Somerset, because we know these two have been at odds since the beginning of time and they seemingly hate each other. But this moment of sadness brings them back together again. Well, I'm not going to say together again. That's a big statement. But it brings them um, to a point where they're having a conversation based on what they both have lost. And that's their sister. So, you know, their sister died in the same manner. And um, I think it makes them recall that. And Thomas says, you know, this is just unfair. And look how life is treating me. You know, first my sister and now my wife. And, you know, he's essentially feeling very sorry for himself. And his brother tries to bring him out of it. And he tells him, you know, your sister lived, our sister lived long enough to watch her son um, be christened. And, you know, your wife lived long enough to, to have some time with her daughter. Those are gifts and you can't erase those just because you're feeling away. You know, Thomas seems to think that he's cursed. And, you know, he thinks his life is this constant struggle. His brother, things have worked out so well for him, but for him it's an uphill battle. And maybe that explains some of the alcoholism and some of his reckless behavior. And, you know, Somerset is like, listen, um, you know, you're, you see it that way. A lot of people would not see your life that way. Almost like, you know, try to be appreciative of what you have because your life is not nearly as bad as you're making it out to be. And these sad feelings that you're having right now and this pity you're in, it, we get it because of what just went happened to you. But let's put this whole thing in perspective. And, um, you know, and, and don't pity yourself to that extent because, you know, what you're seeing is, is skewed because of current events. Um, so I thought that was just a, like, it's sad that they had, you know, the occasion that they, it took that occasion for them to get together and have a brotherly talk. But um, it was good to see it happen because they seem to be at each other's throats all the time. And I'm pretty sure they will be at each other's throats again. But at least there was a temporary ceasefire and they were able to be there for each other when they needed it. So now that Catherine is gone, we learn that Elizabeth is, um, is granted Chelsea Manor. Um, all of Catherine's property was... Um, returned to the crown upon her death and almost all of it goes to Elizabeth including Chelsea Manor you know the home that she was living in with Catherine and Thomas originally and um, you know Elizabeth is shocked to learn this news she's obviously saddened about Catherine's death um, particularly because she tried to apologize and Catherine never responded to her um, but she um, she learns that you know the property is now hers She's believing that she's going to be going under somebody else's care at this point. And she's told that, you know, she, now she's of age. Um, she is going to be the second wealthiest woman in the realm behind her sister. 
and um, it's almost as if she's been given you know the keys to her freedom and her adulthood in this moment and she's overwhelmed um, obviously because it's the first time in her life that she's you know quote unquote been on her own but um, we see that she has a moment where you know the light the switch goes off and she recognizes how powerful this is and that you know sh this is a gift and that she really needs to um, to grow up you know and to move in a different direction and to kind of start becoming the woman that she wants to be and the woman that she needs to be um, we see that she returns to Chelsea Manor um, prior to her coming back we also see that Lady Jane Grey is going back to her family's home because obviously she was there um, you know under the eye of Catherine Parr who has passed Henry Grey when he picks her up um, you know Thomas is sad to see Lady Jane Grey go because he's grown some some affection for her like some natural you know father daughter affection for her not the way he is with Elizabeth but um you know he's sad to see her go you know Henry Gray who has been an asshole pretty much this whole time you know tells tells um Thomas you know you didn't think she was going to stay here right you know obviously under these circumstances and he asked Jane later if in fact if, if Thomas had touched her or if anything had gone on between them and of course Jane says no but you know she also has grown an affection for Thomas so you see that she's sad so anywho Elizabeth comes back to the house and she's walking through it for the first time with fresh eyes because now it's hers and um, you know she finds the letters that she had written to Catherine and she sees that Catherine had opened them and had read them so that hopefully gave her some peace to know that um, you know she wasn't totally being ignored although she does not know if Catherine in fact did forgive her which she probably did but I guess it gives her some peace to know that at least she read Elizabeth's words to her um, the next scene we see where Elizabeth decides to go to court to get an audience with her brother and she comes and you can even see her her walk is different her stance you know her her sense of determination, her confidence. She comes back and she, you know, asks her brother for forgiveness for being absent. You know, she says that she's been unwell, um, you know, I guess in the same vein, trying to squelch some of these rumors about what was going on with her. But, you know, she recognizes that, you know, she needs to, to regain her place in court and she needs to ask for forgiveness and just you know address the elephant in the room and get this over with and just you know be the woman who she's going to be and she asks her brother for forgiveness he grants it he says let's have a celebration and all is good she is back you know into the fold of the crown and while she's sitting you know um with her brother we see thomas lean in and ask her to marry him now that right there, I mean, I'm sure a nice cliffhanger, but Thomas, like, come on, you know, you've done so much damage, you know, you dodged a bullet in a huge way, you know, you dishonored your wife, just stop, you need to just stop at this point and just be happy that, you know, you are, um, you know, you didn't lose your head because you've done a lot of things at this point that could have ended you up on the block. But, you know, this is his, uh, you know, a man is a man is a man. A person is going to be who they are. And just because they suffer a loss or they have an epiphany doesn't mean that they are automatically going to mature overnight, you know. But he asks. And we see in the previews for next week that she seems to be open to it. I mean, I don't know. I'm speculating here because I, I the fact that she was even talking to him and she said something to the effect of you only asking me because Catherine is dead lets me know that she's still enamored with him but you know again I haven't watched episode five yet so I will not get ahead of myself um, but I was good to see Elizabeth you know um, assert herself and grow up a little bit and you know and take on this this more mature role um, juxtaposed with this scene is Mary where she is um, having mass and um, it, what I think this is showing or how I interpreted this as the end is that we're seeing both sisters come into their own and be who they are. You know, Mary is holding mass knowing that her brother has asked her not to and that there's all of this issue going on and that reformation is, be, is a real thing. But she is um, 
you know, standing strong in her faith and she's going to do what she knows is right and she's going to worship her God. And she's also sending a strong message to all the other Catholics that, um, you know, they are going to be a force to be reckoned with and that she is, that she has their back. So, um, this was an excellent, excellent episode. Like I said, so much to unpack, you know, so many changes in, um, I mean, and, and again, this episode went over a period of months, obviously, because, you know, Catherine gave birth and when we, you know, she was barely showing at the end of the last episode. So obviously a lot of time has passed, but great development. And, um, so I am, I'm going to watch episode five and I'm going to do my review and I'm going to do that probably tomorrow or the day after. I know I'm a little bit behind, but, um, great episode. So I would love to hear what you guys thought about it. And um, we can talk about this episode, what we predict for next next episode, um, and all that other good stuff. So stay safe out there. COVID is still a real thing. Wear your mask and and you know avoid large crowds and all that good stuff because um, yes, this feels awful. But I am, but I'm okay and I'm on the mend. So um, have a good one, and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.